Good evening, everybody. Welcome, Hello. Hello. Oh, welcome, Cass. <laughs> Want to make yourself known to everybody? <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome to our event this evening. Uh, it's a great honour to welcome Cass Sunstein to, uh, with us. Um, this is a, a seminar, this is a, a, an evening's discussion put on by the Department of Psychological and Behavioural Science, of which I am the head of the department. My name is Paul Dolan. Um, and it's also event part of the Shape the World series, and I shall read out what this says here. It's held in the LSE as the run-up to the, to the LSE Festival, which is a week-long series of events taking place from Monday to Saturday, the 7th of March, um, 2020. Uh, it's free to attend and open to all, exploring how social sciences can make the world a better place. The full, the full programme will be available later this month. So uh, that's the event. So welcome Cass Sunstein. Cass is a professor at Harvard. Um, he has previously worked with Obama uh, in the White House for a couple of administrations. Um, he is a prolific scholar. Um, it's, it's, it's quite exceptional um, that literally every time you hear Cass talk, he says something new and original, and even if that's only a few hours apart. So, um, literally, it's fucking annoying. <laughs> um, I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, sorry, no, it's not annoying. Um, it's a little annoying. Um, so, Cass, Cass will... Um, talk for about 45 minutes, uh, after which there'll be time for questions and answers and the discussion. So um, I, would, I should also say, as I said earlier to our students, the thing that you don't see from Cass's bio anywhere is that he's genuinely a very, very, very nice and warm man, um, which I'm sure will come across during the course of this presentation. You better make sure you come across as nice and warm. <laughs> um, so um, I should also say a couple of things about housekeeping. If there's a fire, run. Um, the, stewards, the stewards will point you to where we should assemble. That's, that's, uh, that's it, they've um, got their thumbs up. It won't be a drill if there's a fire alarm, so that will mean that there is really a fire that we need to escape from. Um, and you can follow us on the Twitter hashtag. There was one that came up before, um, uh, uh, LSE, how change happens. I should also ask you to put your phones onto silent. You can tweet away, but do it quietly. Um, and after the event, which will finish at uh, 8 o'clock, there will be uh, book sales outside, um, and Cash will be, will be happy to sign books on the stage, actually, it says here, on the stage of the old theatre. So, Cash, don't go anywhere. Books will be brought to you. Um, Mohammed's and Mountains or something, I don't, I don't know. They'll be brought to you if you sign. And there's also, which is an important piece of information, before I don't hold you up any longer, is that there's the drinks reception in the atrium just outside the old theatre for those that wish to stick around afterwards. So, without further ado, welcome Cass. So, it's a tremendous honor. Look at all the people. A lot of you are up there. <laughs> They're rows. Thank you all for coming. Um, so the topic was something um, that I've been thinking about for a long time and that I have got stuck on until relatively recently. And so in autobiographical terms, I'm going to tell you the three events that got me unstuck. Uh, the first was a conversation a few years ago with one, with one of the world's great athletes. For reasons that will become clear, I'm not going to give his name, but he is, uh, you know, sensational, world sensation as an athlete. And I was in a small group of about nine people talking to him at a large event. It was a big cocktail party, and there he was. And I thought I asked him a question I'd always wanted to ask uh, a great athlete, which is, uh, suppose so the entire season depends on your performance, and there's very little time left in the game. He, by the way, is the star. So everything turns on what you do in the next period of time. And everybody's looking at you, and it's all on you. 
I asked him, are you having fun? <laughs> he looked at me and said, am I having fun? Absolutely. That's what I was born for. I've been trained all my life to be doing this. This is what I live for. This is what I enjoy best. You ask me, am I having fun? Absolutely. It's the best time of my life. I confess I was surprised. I play a little sport called squash, and uh, I know some of the very strong players, and that seemed to me an inspiring but not expected reaction. So about 90 minutes later, as the party was going on, I, I asked him, come with me. We went into a corner. I looked at him. I'll give a little identification. He's tall. <laughs> and not incredibly tall, but tall. So I looked up, and I said, your answer really surprised me. Is that, is that true when all the pressure's on you, that you're having a great time? And I said, I, I, he said, do you want the real answer? And I said, absolutely, I want the real answer. And he said, I hate it. <laughs> he said, it's awful. It's horrible. He said, don't get me wrong. I, I know what to do. And he is a clutch performer. He's good under pressure. I know exactly what to do. I'm not going to fail. But am I having fun? It's terrible. No, no fun. That was interesting. And what struck me as interesting about it was in a group of about nine, he was not going to disclose that under pressure, he's living a nightmare. The reason is that could be in the newspaper, and he wasn't going to say it. But he trusted me, and you see I'm not violating his trust, <laughs> that when we went in the equivalent of closed doors, he was willing to tell me the actual truth of his experience. The second kind of autobiographical unlocking the door to these remarks is a paper written about 18 months ago involving Saudi Arabia. It's research into what was then the custom, I think it's been recently changed, but the custom by which Saudi women are not allowed to work outside of the home unless their husbands say it's okay. There's a, by custom, there's a permission necessary. And what the study did was ask young Saudi men what they thought about their wives working outside of the home. And the overwhelming answer was, it's completely fine, or it's good, or it's great. I'm good with it. Then the young Saudi men were asked, what do you think other young Saudi men think? And the answer was equally clear. They think it's terrible. I'm unique in thinking it's OK. Okay, now here's where things got interesting. Half of the Saudi men in the experiment were the control group. They were just monitored in terms of how their family went for the next year. The other half were told, actually, you're wrong about the social norm. Most young Saudi men like you think it's completely fine if wives work outside of the home. Actually, that's the private view. Now here's the kicker. In the group that was told that their own private beliefs were actually widely shared, there was a big spike in the number of women applying for jobs outside of the home and working outside of the home. The revelation of what people privately thought produced quite significant social change along the dimension of sex equality merely by virtue of the fact that people were told that their privately held view was consistent with what other similarly situated people thought privately. The third unlocking was actually very recent. And it's an advertisement on television for a truck. And I just noticed this four days ago when I was finishing these remarks. And as I was actually looking over my remarks, I heard on the television the announcer selling the truck say, Last year, more people bought this truck than in any year before. The truck, by the way, isn't very popular, has never been. So the fact that it was an extremely good year for the truck compared to previous years doesn't mean a whole lot. 
But the probably smart people who got that line in thought that that would activate a form of change on behalf of the truck. Okay, my topic is why social change happens and why it's so hard to anticipate. How can we make it happen if we want to or stop it if we want it to stop? Why does it seem to come often out of nowhere? In Iran, even today, that is today, the recent tea leaves are suggesting there's much more dissatisfaction than the regime than anyone would have expected. And some people are starting to say, don't be surprised if what seemed to be a stable regime destabilizes in a hurry, because what people think privately is evidently the not the same as what they've been willing to say publicly. This also bears on what's happening with climate change, where society may, with respect to climate change, go whoosh in the direction of controls on greenhouse gas emissions. And if societies start to, it will be a puzzle, because for a long time, societies have been relatively stuck. What I hope the remarks will bear on ranges from the rise of fascism in the 1930s, and I'm going to say something directly about that, to contemporary populism, to hashtag Me Too, to civil rights movements of the 1960s, to the rise of feminism in the 1970s, to hashtag Me Too for sure, and movements barely on the horizon. Okay, what I have to do now is to vindicate the premise of the inquiry, which is the surprising nature of social movements. If you're making a list of the greatest social theorists in the history of the human species, Tocqueville might top the list. He's certainly on the top 10, in the top 10. He reported that no one foresaw the French Revolution. No one. That's Tocqueville. Lenin was stunned by the success and speed of the Russian Revolution. That's Lenin. He himself thought, no way this is going to work. And it worked. The Iranian Revolution of the late 20th century was unanticipated by participants. And if you look at contemporaneous pictures, you can kind of see it in real time. Their determination to do something combined with their shock at the numbers and the apparent success of what they were embarking on. Puzzlingly, social movements often seem to come in waves. Successful movements spread from one country to another and within countries for reasons that remain unclear. It's standard in the theoretical literature to speak of two things, demonstration and contagion effects. Demonstration refers to the fact that it can happen, and that's a little bit helpful. Contagion refers to something only slightly more complicated, which is the movement spread. But it's a little like, these explanations are a little like explaining the sleep-inducing effects of opium by reference to opium's dormative properties. That is, it's not much of an explanation to say there's contagion. It's a little better to say there's a demonstration effect, but basically looks like a black box. OK, I'm going to try to uncover the black box by pointing to four factors. I wish there were three. Apologies for four. <laughs> the first is the story of the athlete and the study in Saudi Arabia. And it refers to preference falsification, that what people are willing to say publicly often to people they know very well, diverges from what's inside our heads. Each of us, every human being, has inside our heads some desires or beliefs or aspirations or uh, fears that are not voiced to anyone, maybe to a partner or a close friend, but not to anyone. And that is a bit of a red light on change. Once conditions ripen such that the athlete can tell more than one person how he feels, 
or the Saudi men can say, look, my actual private conviction is what is widely shared, then we have a, an opening for something wholly unanticipated to happen. The second point has to do with diverse thresholds. When the social conditions license a statement or an action that is inconsistent with what most people are said have done, it depends on the success or non-success of the movement, depends on what kind of thresholds people feel they need in order to speak out and act. And each of us has a different threshold. I'm going to try to illustrate that. The third point has to do with interdependencies, that our own willingness to say or do something is highly dependent on what other people are willing to say or do. This is a separate point from the thresholds point, which is individual. It's that social conditions are going to create or stifle a movement. And it's very hard to predict what the interdependencies are going to allow to emerge. Shall I tell you a story about the Chinese government which suggests it has a, a pretty sophisticated understanding of the points I've mentioned about preference falsification, diverse thresholds, and interdependencies? This is, to me, a startling study which will put some meat on what is right now pretty abstract. Uh, an examination of social media on China, in China, very recent, found that if people in China, citizens say, the government is, is doing a bad job, it's really dirty here, we need more freedom, in general, that's allowed. You can say those things on social media in China. The government won't take it down, in general, and no one's going to try to figure out who you are and come to your door. But. If you say on Thursday night at a specified hour, we are going to meet in a specified place, that comes down immediately. They take that one down. The reason appears to be they know a single voice saying something basically means nothing. But a statement of a social gathering can overcome thresholds, can produce interactions, and can create an undoing of preference falsification. That's what they're worried about. And both practice and theory suggests they're right. The fourth point has to do with group polarization. And the point here is that groups of people typically end up in a more extreme point in line with their pre-deliberation tendencies. If you want to create a social movement, to get like-minded people together, talking about the issue together, is an excellent recipe for activation. Blocking it is an excellent way of stopping a social movement. If we put these four points together, we can see the difficulty of anticipating social movements and also how they change. Some of the most interesting recent work in behavioral science suggests that if people are told that there is a new or emerging social norm, for example, in favor of healthy eating or sustainability, then the likelihood that they will behave in accordance with the emerging social norm jumps a lot. Now, that is a nice modification of the claim that if people learn what a social norm is, they'll behave in accordance with it. This claim is you can sometimes be more successful by pointing to a new or emerging social norm. One reason, and this points to the sense of the demonstration effects hypothesis, is that if you know people are quitting smoking, for example, increasingly, there's a demonstration that it can happen. It looks possible. People think their own capacity to do it is real. A second is if they know what the emerging norm is, they believe that the change is valued by others. It matters to them. That's why they're doing it. And third, they believe that change is compatible with their social identity. If people think, I'm the sort of person who, and the emerging norm is sustainable or healthy, they can attach their own self-understanding onto that. Now, this is about personal change, the examples I've given, but it can be about larger scale change also. OK, to get at the point of preference falsification, the first of the quartet, I'm going to tell you about the only book on Nazism 
that I really enjoyed reading. And I will confess that reading books about Nazism, that's hard, yes? They're painful reading. But there's one book that is, it verges on the cheerful. It's about an American in the 1950s of German descent who went back to Germany in the 1950s to talk to former Nazis to try to figure out how did this happen? And his own good nature maps on to his ability to connect with his interlocutors, the former Nazis, whom to his surprise he called his friends because they all became his friends. He liked each and every one. And if you read the book, uh, the, uh, uh, you will probably like them too. They're likable people. Okay, here's just one exchange he had. He asked one of, of the former Nazis, he said, uh, was there opposition under Hitler? Weren't people upset? Weren't they opposing him? And the answer was, opposition? How would anyone know? How would anyone know what somebody else opposes or doesn't oppose? That a man says he opposes or doesn't oppose depends on the circumstances. Where and when and to whom and just how he says it. And even then you must still guess why he says what he says. Now that's an offhand remark in an interview by someone without social science training, but it's brilliant, isn't it? He's pointing to the intensity of prevailing social norms which can make unreadable a statement of opposition or of lack of opposition. This is a plea for recognition of pluralistic ignorance in which people don't know what other people prefer or believe. Under regimes that are oppressive, preference falsification is pervasive. People might silence themselves. They might say they like the existing practice when they hate it. They may shut up entirely. Their friends and neighbors might have absolutely no idea what they actually think. For those who want to protect, predict the success of a movement, it might be small, it might involve a product, it might be large, it might involve a regime. The challenge is that there's a wedge between what people say and do and what's actually in their heads. They're like my athlete friend. Okay, the Nazi passage is from the 1950s. Here are some words from a computer programmer from Syria, and basically these are the day before yesterday. So this is really recent. When you meet somebody coming out of Syria for the first time, you start to hear the same sentences, that everything is okay in Syria. Syria is a great country. The economy is doing great. It'll take him like six months up to a year to become a normal human being again to say what he thinks, what he feels. Then they might start whispering. They won't speak loudly. That is too scary. After all that time, even outside of Syria, you feel that someone is listening. Someone is recording. Now these are points about Nazism and a regime that is not welcoming of diverse views. But there are intense norms often operating, even in well-functioning democracies, where seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, to say that the United Kingdom should exit from the European Union was taboo, even though a lot of people believed it. But they wouldn't say it. And that made usable their views if they could be elicited. There was a study in the United States right before the election of President Trump which asked people whether they'd contribute to a xenophobic organization. And under one condition, it was anonymous. Under one condition, it wasn't anonymous. You might not be surprised to hear that there was a big disparity between the magnitude of giving under anonymity and non-anonymity. People thought they were anonymous, they'd give to the xenophobic organization. If not, much less likely. But if people were reminded in a treatment group that President Trump was leading in the polls in their state, 
the difference between anonymous and non-anonymous giving to a xenophobic organization went to zero. It dissipated. It was eliminated. In a follow-up study, the same disparity between anonymous and non-anonymous giving was observed. When people were informed that, just as a side point, President Trump is the president, it disappeared. It went to zero. And that is a close sibling, almost a twin, of the Saudi Arabia study, isn't it? Where the existence of a license or not from an understanding of the social norm makes all the difference. Okay, to get at diverse thresholds, I have to tell you a slightly embarrassing personal story. I was in a country in the Middle East uh, a number of years ago and walking with uh, an Irish-American friend and the fact that he's Irish-American is relevant. Uh, not very tall, maybe um, you know, but coming up to here on me, wiry. And we came up uh, to a street uh, in a tough neighborhood and there was a father beating up his 10-year-old son. It was an unforgettable moment. Not endangering his life or anything, but basically beating him up bad. Before I could even think, my friend ran 100 meters to the scene and said, stop beating up your son in English. The father did not speak English. And he looked at my friend with shock. And I was right behind my friend. A little embarrassing. My friend was there like that. I was right behind him. I didn't go first. He went first. The story has a happy ending. Even though my friend was speaking English, the father, it was a universal language, don't hit. And the father stopped hitting his son. The story shows that people require different levels of social support before they will join a movement or say what they think or do something. Some people are rebels by nature. They require no support at all. They might be foolish, committed, or really brave. My friend was that. Let's call him a zero in the sense that his threshold was Nothing. The zeros might be isolated. No one may join them, in which case they look radical, foolhardy, or crazy, and they never make it in the history books. Others require a little support. They won't move unless someone does, but if someone does, they will. Call them the ones. In this case, I was a one. Others require more than a little. Guess what they're called? They're the twos. They won't do anything unless they see the zeros and the ones. But if they do, they'll join as well. And then there are people with different thresholds, all the way up to the infinites, defined as people who won't join a movement or act out or speak, no matter what. The infinites are really interesting, I think. They might be scared, they might be loyal, they might be kind, they might be conflict averse. They exist. Outside of science fiction, it's really hard to see people's thresholds. And I think no one has sufficient introspection to know fully what our thresholds are. You might think of yourself as a seven, but on certain, under certain conditions, you might be a zero. You might think of yourself as three, but under certain conditions, wow, you're an 11. And whether you're proud to be a zero or an 11 or an infinite really depends on the context. So I gave an example of someone who was a hero, my friend. But there are other situations in which they're out there with the fascists immediately, and they're not heroes. OK, this is a recipe for social surprise. We can think about small things like cars that take off in the marketplace, the Tesla. That's not that small, relatively small. Or huge things like a, social, a society turning around. Here's John Adams writing about the American Revolution. 
Idolatry to monarchs and servility to aristocratical pride was never so totally eradicated from so many minds in so short a time. Thomas Paine put it almost the same way. He said, our style and manner of thinking have undergone a revolution more extraordinary than the political revolution of a country. We see with other eyes, we hear with other ears, and think with other thoughts than those we formerly used. It's not a great idea to argue with John Adams or Thomas Paine, who were there at the time, but I'm going to may argue with them a little bit. Having spent a large part of the last three years focusing on the era in which they wrote and reading the documents, they didn't have it quite right. There were a number of people in the American colonies at the time who were aflame with an idea of the equal dignity of human beings. But they didn't talk about it except privately. They were twos or eights or twelves or seventeens. They were my athlete. They were the Saudi men. It took zeros and ones and twos to get them to say publicly what they were thinking privately. To get to the third point, interdependencies, I have to give a quotation from a woman named Beverly Young Nelson, who accused a prominent Senate candidate named Roy Moore of having sexually assaulted her in the 1970s. And this has the same degree of precision, I think, as the uh, former Nazi and the Syrian. I thought that I was Mr. Moore's only victim. I would probably have taken what Mr. Moore did to me to my grave had it not been for the courage of four other women who were willing to speak out about their experiences with Mr. Moore. Their courage has inspired me to overcome my fear. Interdependencies point to the fact that the behavior of the ones, the twos, the threes, etc., depend crucially on who, if anyone, is seen to have done what. If the zeros go first, then the ones, then the twos, then the threes, and so forth, which is more or less what's happened with hashtag me too, then something will happen. Something major might happen. Under imaginable assumptions, we're going to have significant social change, but only given the right distribution of thresholds and the right kind of visibility. If you think the movement for disability rights and gay rights, they follow this pattern where there were the zeros and the ones and the twos, and roughly the right sequence happened such that people saw one another at the right time, promoting something that has affected you know, international human rights documents. The crucial point is that the conditions have to be just right. If there are no zeros, no one like my Irish-American friend, and if no one sees any zeros, then nothing's going to happen. If there are some zeros but few ones, then the movement won't get off its feet. If most people are tens or thousands or tens of thousands, the same is true even if there are some ones, twos, threes, fours, and so forth. Let me tell you about a little uh, empirical study. It's about music downloads. It has a crazy result, but it shows this happening under tightly controlled conditions. There's a website that has music by bands that aren't particularly known. They have songs which, which such names as Trapped in an Orange Peel, and Gnaw, G-N-A-W. These aren't promising names, yes, for songs? But some of the songs evidently are pretty good. Here's how the study went. In the control condition, people could listen to the songs just like on you know, familiar iTunes, et cetera, and downloads the ones they liked. And then you had a distribution of popularity among many thousands of uh, listeners. And take that, the control condition that gives you an accurate measure of what people like. In the treatment condition, everything was the same, except that people could see how often the songs had been downloaded by the people who were, by the magic of the computer, supported in, uh, sorted into their subgroup. So 
an eighth of this room could be in a subgroup in which you can see how many people are downloading NAW. You can see in this group how many people in your group are downloading trapped in an orange peel. The tempting hypothesis is that the good songs are going to win out no matter what eventually. And the distribution of popularity in the treatment groups will eventually be the same as in the control groups. That's not what happened. What happened was while the very top song could never crash in any of the other worlds, and while the very bottom songs, you probably all know that I was in a rock group. It's bad to brag, but I was in a rock group called Synergy. You all know about Synergy. Kind of <laughs> loved us now even, but we've danced to our songs a lot. OK, we had no songs released because we were so terrible, uh, incompetent and horrible. Uh, if we had put a song on the music downloads experiment, no one would have liked it, even if it got some early downloads. And that is true of the better songs, but the bad songs, they crashed in the control group. They crashed in the treatment group, too. But other than the very best and very worst, anything could happen, which is to say that initial popularity can breed in an extremely unlikely condition something like a movement in favor of trapped in an orange peel. A more recent study has shown this happens exactly the same way for political beliefs. If people see that people like them are nervous about genetically modified food, or people of their party are concerned about nanotechnology, then what can happen can be exactly what happened to trapped in an orange peel and gnaw. It can become the issue of the groups intense concern, or not, depending on the social interdependencies. If this is uh, not quite translucent, I'm going to give you one more example from the music field, which is the most vivid example I know of. There's a movie a few years ago that won the Oscar um, called Searching for Sugar Man about a Detroit songwriter named Sisto Rodriguez. And all you have to know is that Rodriguez released two albums in the 1970s. They were unsuccessful, and he became a demolition worker who didn't have a music career. But in South Africa, he was bigger than the Beatles. He was bigger than the Rolling Stones. He was Bob Dylan. Why did that happen? The hypothesis is that interdependencies led to success for him in South Africa as in the music downloads experiment, but didn't happen anywhere else. Of course he had to be good, and he's pretty good. But whether there's big noise about him depends on what's just described. OK, now let's talk about group polarization, the final building block. I did a study a few years ago in two cities one of which was right of center and one of which was light of center, left of center. In one, the left of center city and the right of center, I asked people whether they thought something like the Paris Treaty was a good idea. And we got a distribution of views. And you won't be shocked to hear they liked it better in the left of center city than in the right of center city. But in the right of center city, some people liked the Paris Agreement and the intensity of their views varied. There was diversity in the right of center city. Just as in the left of center city, people liked the Paris Accord, but some people didn't. And the intensity of their enthusiasm varied across the groups. Then I sorted them into six-person groups, all consisting of left of center or right of center people, and asked them, having recorded their anonymous views privately, to, to come to a group verdict and then to record their anonymous pri views privately again. What I was interested in seeing was what would happen to their anonymous statement of views after talking for 20 minutes to a half an hour with like-minded people. And the finding was simple. As a result of those conversations, the people in the right of center city became unified, confident, and sharply opposed to the Paris Agreement. In the left of center city, people became unified, confident, and extremely enthusiastic about something like the Paris Agreement. That is to say that while the groups were this far apart before they talked with like-minded others, 
after they talked to each other, they were like this. They were in different political universes. That is a finding of group polarization, which means that like-minded people speaking to one another typically end up in a more extreme position in line with their pre-deliberation tendencies. And it happens on social media every minute of every day. And it happens in nations basically all the time. The intensity of political disagreement is often a product of the fact that people are talking or listening mostly to like-minded others. The most parsimonious explanation of why this happens, by the way, and I've seen the tapes, so I saw it happening in real, in real time, is crazy simple. If you have a group of people who think Brexit is a good idea, that's the predominant tendencies. Some not sure, some opposed. But the dominant view is it's a good idea. If they talk to each other, just as a matter of statistics, the number of arguments that will support Brexit will be higher than the number that are opposed to Brexit. And the people who offer arguments for Brexit will be more timid and fewer in the, what they say. If people are listening to each other after they've heard everything, they'll be more enthusiastic about Brexit. It's just a logic of statistics. The word timid captures the slightly subtle, subtler explanation, which is people don't want to look like outliers. And if they look like dissidents within groups, they feel bad about themselves and a little less popular. And after having done that, they'll shift a bit in the direction of the predominant tendency. OK, we have all of the moving parts in place. Preference falsification, diverse thresholds, interdependencies, and group polarization. It should now be clear why social movements are often impossible to predict and also how to produce or stop them. First, we don't know what people's internal preferences are. By hypothesis, by hypothesis they can't be observed. Second, and I think this is a more uh, severe difficulty for would-be predictors, we don't know what people's thresholds are. They, too, are unobservable, and introspection doesn't help a whole lot. Also, we can't anticipate social interactions. Who is going to hear what, when, and from whom? In the case of oppressive societies, we might be able to know that people are widely miserable or dissatisfied. We might know that. But that's not enough, even if we know it. We need to know who's going to be talking to whom. Google probably knows more than any entity in the history of humanity about what people secretly think. And there's a fantastic book out called Everybody Lies, which looks at Google searches to see what people actually like and care about. And there are some big surprises in the book. Something like Google's access to what people are searching for does tell us a lot that we wouldn't otherwise know. And that's good and important to hear. Incidentally, one thing the author highlights, which will be good news for some people in the room, and maybe in some ways good news for everyone in the room, is men like older women. That's just the fact. That's what comes out of the Google searches. OK, um, given that, not that particular, given that general finding, we might think that Google would be able to know stuff. But since we don't know who's going to be interacting with whom, who is going to see whom and when, we won't be able to have the kind of prescience that is required. OK, the uh, intelligence of the Chinese government's approach to its own social media emerges in this light, doesn't it? There's the author of a book on behavioral finance. It's a good book. It's a very academic and obscure book. I follow him on Twitter. He tweets regularly, my book is doing much better than expectations. Thank you for the support. <laughs> I've checked, and the book is doing really badly, even though it's a good book. It is doing better than expectations, and it's doing more better than expectations than it would if not for his smart tweeting. He is pointing, pouring a point. He is trying to create the equivalent of a cascade effect, as in the music lab. 
Okay, with respect to movements on the horizon, I'm also going to tell you something a bit personal, which is that when I was up for confirmation by the United States Senate, I almost didn't make it through. And one reason was that I had written some things favorable about animal rights. I have a daughter who is a vegan and who very much cares about animal rights. And I've been influenced by her, and I've written favorably about animal rights. The degree of, uh, let's call it, what's the right word, uh, norm violence that I received, including a literal credible death threat, but that was, you know, let's put that one to one side, uh, was uh, not easily forgotten. And actually, until doing these remarks on social movements, I've been extremely reluctant to come out and say I actually care about animal rights and animal welfare. I don't think I'm alone in that, and that if there is a movement that's prime for something in the next generation, it might be here because I'm here to say, and even as I say it, I say it with what I can't help but having some fear and trembling, there is a movement that is ripe once people start saying what they think and acting on the basis of what they think. Okay, for social movements, there's a larger point here, which is that when movements succeed, small and large, ex post explanations often point to large cultural factors, something in a culture, something in history's arc, that suggests that it was bound to happen. That's what hindsight suggests. If these remarks are right, social movements that we take as inevitable are often a product of small, random, or serendipitous factors of who did what when, of who heard what when, or whether some kind of butterfly flapped its wings at the right moment. It's tempting to think that some practice was bound to shift, but it really wasn't. It happened to shift. The same is true if it didn't. It happened not to shift. OK, this has been a pretty um, uh, bare bones account, notwithstanding the number of words. And I'm going to have to introduce just three complications before ending. The first complication comes from a woman speaking in North Korea also very recently. So this is current, not history. The woman said, it never occurred to me that I could or would want to do anything about it. It was just how things are. That's almost a haiku, isn't it? It never occurred to me that I could or would want to do anything about it. It was just how things are. Okay, the most important word in those sentences is want. She isn't talking about preference falsification. She's not like the athlete I met. She's talking about her desires. This suggests that people's preferences may be adaptive to the status quo. They might not have to work very hard to shut themselves up. They might not even think that the existing practice is bad. Fully adaptive preferences are an extreme case. It might be better to speak of partially adaptive preferences and people are in some sense aware that something isn't right and might be different. But the awareness takes the form of a small voice in the head to which people don't pay a lot of attention. But the idea of preference falsification is just wrong when people's preferences are an artifact of the status quo. Okay, I have one more personal story, this last one I promise, but this is produced when I was doing these remarks. And I thought of uh, a conversation I had had decades before. It was in the 1980s with my mother. It was approximately 1988. And she asked me, we talked every Sunday, what are you working on? And I said, I'm working on feminism and law. And she said, no. And I said, what? And she said, it's funny how, in that, the way I said what right there, the inflection, that's exactly how I spoke to my mother. She's no longer alive. That's exactly how I spoke to her. And she said, you work on government regulation and constitutional law. You don't work on that stuff. And I said, well, I'm interested in it now. She said, no. 
it, 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 that's, no, that's terrible. What's that about? Bra burning. It's terrible. And I said, it's important, and people are doing good work on it. It's relevant to the Constitution. And she really let me have it. And she, my mother had a terrible temper, and a really very hot temper, and I felt it uh, over the phone. And I got mad back. And I said, Ma, that's what I called her, uh, look, uh, there are people working on uh, sexual harassment in the workplace and uh, sexual violence. And uh, this is law, and it's really important, and it's happening. And you know, I'm trying to learn about it. And my mother paused. And, she, and she, my mother hardly ever paused. This is the only time I remember her pausing. <laughs> uh, she paused for an uncomfortably long time. And then she said to her son three words that she had never said before and she never said since to me. She said, God bless you. And when she said those words, what she was telling me by her tone of voice was, you don't know the half of it. She was telling me, I know, I understand it, I know it, my life has had it. She was also, I read in her, your father knows, I get it. The rise of hashtag me too is a case study in what can happen to adaptive or partially adaptive preferences. Here the mechanism of change is incompletely understood. I think it's happening in Iran now. But there's no question that as social norms shift, preferences as in North Korea can unadapt. Second point. The word preferences is descriptive and maybe misleading. It might be better to speak of people's experiences or beliefs or values under an oppressive regime, and now I mean to include you know, basically great societies in which something not good is happening, as well as thoroughly oppressive regimes. People might believe that terrible injustices are committed or that their values are being violated. To say they're concealing what they prefer isn't adequate. They're concealing their deepest convictions and what actually happened to them. That's fake news. Last point. Social movements aren't simply about the revelation of preferences, experiences, beliefs, and values. They're also about the transformation of those things. Any social movement alters what people believe and what they like. It doesn't just elicit pre-existing judgment. It produces new ones. Part of the point of some social movements and one of their greatest achievements is to turn a sense of embarrassment and shame into a sense of personal dignity. OK, we're living in a world in transition along multiple dimensions. Some of the signs of transformation this year, this month, are good and promising, some less so. What is being falsified might be deservedly falsified. Social norms keep a lot of ugly or dangerous or uncharitable thoughts out of the public sphere. That is an achievement. It's central to civilization. But these remarks, which have been mostly about change without particular valence, they also have a moral heart. And I'm now going to say what it is. People all over the world have thoughts about injustice or wrongdoing. Things are not as right as they might be. They might involve the workplace. They might involve the family. They might involve an employer. They might involve the nation. Human progress depends often on someone somewhere giving those people a kind of permission slip or a green light. Recall once more the statement from the computer programmer from Syria. When you meet somebody coming out of Syria for the first time, you start to hear the same sentences, that everything is OK. 
it'll take like six months up to one year to become a normal human being, to say what he thinks, what he feels. Then he might start whispering. They won't speak loudly, but eventually they're going to. Thanks. On. Yeah, thank you so much, Cass. Um, thank you for that. So we have we have about half an hour now for questions. Um, I should also have just I should have in the introduction also welcome people that are watching um, online. So welcome the live streamers. Uh, we can't take questions from you, but we will we'll take questions from the audience. So could I just ask you to keep your questions concise because I want to try and take a few. Uh, thank you. So we go to the middle here. His hand went up straight away. First of all, yeah. are there mics or? Uh, there are mics, excellent. So please wait for the mic to come to you. Maybe I'll come to the ends of the rows, easier. Um, no, I won't. Um, here we go. Anticipation of the question. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Is this on? Um, what do you make of counter revolutions? Uh, any of the social movements you mentioned, you know, Black Lives Matter, climate change, Me Too, even, uh, they've all elicited quite strong uh, counter movements. Do you think that we're more contrary now than we ever used to be? You know, this idea of um, maybe the Earth is actually flat. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a free-thinking person. I'm not going to just believe what the TV told me. Okay, so um, one of my heroes, Daniel Kahneman, was interviewed not long ago, and he was asked a lot of questions to which he had no answer. And finally, the interviewer said, well, what do you think? And he said, it's an empirical question. It's not a matter of thinking. And so pathetically, I've made a bumper sticker out of his statement. It's an empirical question. It's not a matter of thinking, though I've been too scared to put it actually on my car. <laughs> so on whether people are more contrary now than they were you know, X number of years ago, I, I just don't know the answer to that. Um, the point about counter-revolution, it's fantastic, and there, there's a lot to be uh, thought through about them. Counter-revolutions have some of the same challenges as social movements in the first instance, don't they? If they look like the counter-revolutionaries isolated, then it's going to be terrible. If it looks like the counter-revolutionary is part of a, a silent majority. So President Richard Nixon's term, the silent majority, that was ingenious, saying that there are a lot of people here like you who think the so-called revolution of the 60s left is nonsense. And that was you know, equivalent to a license. And you can think of the Chinese government in its way as counter-revolutionary with respect to dissenting views. They're trying to stop it. And they are using the same techniques. The disability rights movement uh, at least at some point, has, was very alert to some of these ideas. They had a good working knowledge of it. And they tried to create group polarization by getting communities of disabled people together so that they could air their concerns and heighten their interest in, in doing something. So I, I don't, don't have a view on magnitudes of contrariness. My, my, my guess is that uh, if we measured contrariness across uh, Talk to a human population mean over a course of 2,000 years, it would be pretty flat, but that's uh, violating Kahneman's dictum. <laughs> thank you. Yep, comes to the front here, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you hear me? You're on. Yeah. Um, I am doing my dissertation here in Paul's department for my PhD on um, the research you referenced, uh, Sparkman and Walton's dynamic norms, and on plant-based eating. So there has been this sudden surge in plant-based eating um, over the last couple of years. How much of that do you think is due to preference falsification as opposed to good marketing? And, and could you say more about what you think the role of the markets and public policy might be in, in both starting and sustaining social change? 
Okay, so I'll speculate a little about plant-based eating. So there are a number of people, and Peter Singer has been very, you know, um, uh, eloquent about this, a number of people who are uh, very concerned about cruelty to animals once cruelty to animals is visible and salient to them. Um, but when they see a hamburger or chicken on their plate, that's what they eat, and there's a, there's a disconnect. Uh, but in their minds, there's somewhere between a, a tiny, tiny, tiny voice for a lot of people of, it'd be better if I weren't a meat eater, and a loud but suppressible voice saying, it'd be better if I weren't a meat eater. What plant-based uh, options look like increasingly is a low-cost mechanism for acting in accordance with your moral values, which may not be intensely held. They might be softly held, but they're not nothing. And if the cost of being not a meat eater is close to zero, then you can see movement. So it's reducing the cost, the options, and also there's a sense that I think on the in some places that there's an emerging norm, and that it would be uh, good for your self your self understanding, and good for uh, your relations with others to act in accordance with it. So, with our, the so if any of you reads science fiction, one reason science fiction is often fun is it's alert to multiple equilibria that societies can go you know one place or another place based on a relatively small shock. <coughs> and they could look fundamentally different based on that. And the Music Lab experiment is a case study in that. To say that we could have a world without the Beatles, even though there's a terrific movie called Yesterday, which, you know the movie Yesterday? <coughs> See it if you haven't. Uh, uh, it de depicts a world without the Beatles. It's very hard to understand what it would look like. But there could be a world in which the Beatles broke up early or never made it or something. And this is just an example of something cultural rather than ethical slash political. So reduced costs, a sense of an emerging norm, the marketing has helped. Here's another little point, which is um, I think the behavioral types, especially on ethically inflamed, infused, let's say, issues, often emphasize the importance of being good more than the importance of enjoying life. And um, so Pepsi has a drink called Diet Pepsi, which in Europe has not been spectacularly successful. It has another drink, which in Europe has been spectacularly successful. I'm not sure about in London, but Pepsi Max, fantastic success in Europe. Yeah. Diet Pepsi, not so much. They taste pretty similar to these taste buds. Pepsi, Diet Pepsi sounds you know, worthy and diety and like self-punishment and I'll do it, no calories. Pepsi Max sounds joyful and exuberant and by the way, no calories. So to have something more Pepsi Max-ish for the plant-based movement where people don't feel, okay, the cows aren't gonna suffer, but instead this is tastes great. That's probably uh, partly the direction in which the movement has been going, and good for that. Excellent, thank you. Let's take a hand from upstairs. You choose. Yep, there you go. Thank Hello. you. Hello. I've been doing some work in Scotland helping towards the well-being economy ambitions there. And I'm interested if, say, for Paul Dolan's work, there's um, objective things that might make us happy and well, is it okay to, in this, uh, encourage change towards, uh, well, A, do you believe that there are some objective things that humans need to be well? And if that's the case, what's the sort of ethics or motivations behind nudging and encouraging change in those areas to people okay. who might not See if you give the right answer to this attack. question. <laughs> okay, so that's a fantastic question. So, and it has various pieces. So, uh, Paul Dolan, who may be in this room even, uh, <laughs> is, is probably the world's leader of theorists about subjective well being and its importance. And the fact that people care about pleasure, enjoying their lives, and they care about purpose, having meaning in their lives. And these are two things that can actually be measured and they can be pro promoted or undermined. 
So is that true? Yes, I, I believe that it, both things are true. Do people make mistakes? Uh, I'll give you a funny example. Uh, when I was in the White House, I ran into a friend in the basement of the White House, and I asked him how he was doing, and he said, well, in terms of day-to-day -day happiness, it's terrible, but in terms of life satisfaction, it's fantastic. <laughs> and he was basically saying, pleasure, no, awful. A uh, sense of purpose, fant really, really good. So these are real things. Um, and very important. New Zealand, I know, has a well-being budget, and while it's a first step, it, only a first step, a first step is phenomenal. And it seems like we're maybe in the initial stage, as I tried to work on this in the US government, and some things have been done, moving towards a focus, on, a direct focus on well-being as a policy instrument. So that's number one. Number two, the, on nudging, um, Keep in mind that nudges are choice-preserving uh, instruments that uh, steer people in directions to make their lives go better. Now, we need something like Paul's work and that of Richard Layard and others to know what it means to know their lives go better. But let's just stipulate we've, we've filled that in with the right thing. Uh, to have an architecture of life that is promoting well-being of people by their own lights isn't morally problematic. It's, it, it's, it's more closely morally compulsory. Yes, if a, if a government is uh, not doing that but doing the opposite, that would be very bad. Now, there are things to be said about what's the ethical framework within which we evaluate it, and there are two kind of off-the-rack candidates. Uh, one would be utilitarian and, you know, Benthamite in a large sense, and that would be pretty easily combined with the subjective welfare where we'd have uh, utility maximizing nudging. It might be so that people you know, can find their way around Heathrow. <coughs> That's not ethically problematic, that people have a good experience at Heathrow because they don't get lost. Or we could have something where uh, the design of London is such that people enjoy going from one place to another in, in a city. So that, and, or it could be more contentious having to do with diet and exercise. So long as it's um, choice preserving, the risk to welfare is reduced because people aren't forced to do something they hate. Another ethical framework would be Kantian by which people are treated as ends not means. And you could imagine a wide range of interventions which are respectful of people's capacity for agency like giving them information about things that can make their lives go better. So basically, we're, in terms of your question, we're uh, at, at the very early stages of doing what we now know enough to know what should be done, and we're at the relatively early stages of knowing what should be done. So this is one of the best things about 2020 is that the opportunities here for helping people's lives are, you know, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Thank you. Let's stay upstairs. <laughs> Shoes again. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. It's not my fault she's not coming over. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to what extent can your observations about the forces for social change be applied to organisations? And I'm thinking particularly about um, falsification of preferences. I, I know that I falsify my preferences at work every day. Otherwise, I'd, <laughs> I'd be sacked. So I'm interested, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. So uh, you can think of an employer trying to have a uh, well-performing or happy workplace. Or you can think of employees trying to improve their lives. And an employer can take steps to elicit, under circumstances that guarantee confidentiality, people's actual views. And then if people are you know, not having as good an experience as the boss would like, the boss can find ways of doing that. I heard, by the way, uh, with the last few weeks of a very high-level executive in California in the entertainment industry who was completely on your point and he's like the boss, and he has a large workforce. And what he arranged was that there's another person 
who isn't much in touch with him, who is also high level, but who doesn't speak to him a whole lot, who would be the uh, uh, reliable repository of employee concerns, such that the person who was concerned will never be known to the boss, the, the intensity or fact or nature of the concern will never be identified to the person, but the high but less high person will report to the boss in the occasional, not that frequent interactions, people are miserable here about this. So institutional design can be used at the, you know, the higher level to protect this and for employees to do it in a way that's consistent with, you know, having a good culture to say, you know, there's practices here that aren't ideal and maybe we should find a way to communicate to that with someone who can change them. Okay, thank you. Let's come back downstairs. Do you want to pick someone from this side? Given the role of the internet and social media in deepening group polarization by allowing people to selectively view content that exclusively affirms their views, what do you believe the future holds for constructive debate and political compromise in democracies? That's a really good question. A a a a uh, Amos Tversky, you know, one of the founders of modern behavioral science, uh, said he was an optimist and the reason he was an optimist was that it's rational to be an optimist, because if you're a pessimist, you suffer twice. <laughs> once when you're thinking about it, and once when the bad thing happens. So with respect to social media, there's uh, uh, big challenges right along the dimension you describe, where there's a capacity for self-sorting, such that people have are living in group polarization machines. And there's also, uh, algorithm I think should be a verb. So people are algorithmed into uh, echo chambers to a significant extent. And both of these are problems for democratic compromise. What's to be done? Okay, you could imagine a, an institutional fix which uh, creates um, insulation on the, in, in terms of day-to-day -day governance from what's happening on Twitter or Facebook. And uh, that's a good idea. So here there's a superb civil service, which is not thinking, you know, how are people voting on social media today, but are thinking what, what are technically should we do about road safety or food safety? And in many countries, the um, capacity of governance day-to-day to treat the noise of social media as background rumbling is sufficiently high that it's, it's not that bad. Now, this is a conception of government which isn't as thickly democratic as many would like because it places a big premium on uh, people who know stuff doing things ultimately accountable to the public but not subject to day-to-day -day assessment. I saw in the United States government often when things were working well, our, the equivalent of our Ministry of Transport, our Department of Transportation, the civil servants there are amazingly good. And when they are working on an issue involving uh, flight safety or railroad safety or automobile safety, they know what to do. They're, they're superb. And to give them running room is a really good idea. Subject, of course, if the public thinks something's really wrong, then that needs to be taken into account and possibly responded to. I think this is a more technocratic answer than you're after, so let me give a less <laughs> technocratic answer. Uh, it's the obligation of social media providers to counteract some of the adverse effects they're having on uh, social media. Uh, I work uh, occasionally with Facebook, and they've done some quite good things. Um, they have done some things that aren't good also. So the, the trend line is positive in terms of how they use the news feed, where in 2016 they proudly said, this will sort you into a communications package that you would choose if it's what you wanted. That's a paraphrase, but it's pretty close. And that's, uh, in my view, a nightmare of a group polarization machinery, where it creates self-sorting by virtue of the algorithm. And that was proudly called out 
in 2016. Now, it's not the worst thing to celebrate individual choice. That has an admirable and, in many ways, you know, uh, correct foundation. But for your reason, in this context, it's not ideal. The news feed is no longer doing that. It uh, relies on certain uh, filters and uh, functions that are kind of complicated, but that uh, are not as severely echo chambering people as before. I worry that where Facebook is, and this is just one example, isn't where it should be. And uh, fa the fact that Facebook recently said that they would not do anything basically about falsehoods and political ads, uh, that was not Facebook's finest moment. Uh, when I say wouldn't do anything about it, I think that's very close to exactly correct. If it's not exactly correct, it's uh, what they do with respect to po falsehoods and political ads is modest. To their credit and connected with the echo chamber point, they recently said they are going to take down deep fakes. And uh, you know what deep fakes are? They can basically take anyone of whom they have a picture, including you, and make you look like you're doing or saying essentially anything. That's scary. They can make a political figure look like she or he is best buddies with a terrorist, and it's completely credible to the eye. They said they're going to I'm simplifying a bit, but they're going to take them down, and that's that's a very good step. I just wonder. I mean, I, not not wishing to defend uh, these technology companies or social media for one second. I just wonder to what degree, if we recast the narrative around the echo chambers, is that we're living in a we were living in a very oddly consensual time 20 or 30 years ago, and that's the exception rather than the rule, that actually we've been polarised through great swathes of history, and that it's a bit like explaining crime rates. People try to explain why, why they fell, but actually what we should instead be doing was to explain why they were exceptionally high for, for some time, because that recasts our understanding. I just wonder to what degree, if we recast that polarisation debate in terms of this is actually now a return to the norm, and we had a very odd period in the post-war times. Okay, that's, that's great. So here's my candidate for the coolest, basically unknown paper of the last 15 years. It was published in some very reputable place, but I've never heard anyone refer to it. And, uh, and the paper, what the paper does is it shows uh, you get dot, blue dots and green dots, and you're asked which are blue and which are green, and people make sorting. Then as the experiment, and then, then, then there are some in the middle that are kind of purple, maybe blue, maybe green. Then as the experiment continues, the number of green dots recedes generally, and people start seeing more, I don't have the facts exactly right, but basically this, they start seeing things as green that they'd formerly characterized as blue. So that as the number of blue dots becomes higher in proportion, things that formerly seem blue too start to seem green. Now, if the, if the underlying mechanism seems obscure, here's something in the same like two-page paper. If people are asked whether something is ethical, when they see a distribution of you know, ethical, not ethical, they have one set of judgments. Then as the number of really non-ethical things starts to get smaller, they start to see things as non-ethical that they formerly thought were, were ethical. That is to say, with things like uh, moral judgments and with things also about color, what we see as blue or purple or green or what we see as ethical or not depend on what else is in the background. So the finding is the immense power of the normal. Uh, one way to put it is in a society in which there's a lot of corruption, if a police officer asks for a small bribe, that seems fine. In a society in which there's very little corruption, a police officer asking for a bribe is an outrage. And that's the study of colors and the study of ethical behavior. And I think this is true with respect to uh, social division and echo chambering. So you might think in the arc of history, where we are right now is basically normal. And the period of less, let's just stipulate there was less, was unusual. That's probably true. I think the, the music of the question was, uh, on the normative side, the period where we had a capacity for, a better capacity, let's say, for a regal debate was better. And even if it was unique, uh, 
let's get lots of blues. Some, something like yeah, that. It just it just, reca it just recasts what we might think of as as ways to intervene and change. Yes. I, I think. Yes. Um, can we come to this side of the room, please, upstairs, to a hand of your choosing? Good evening. Um, I was particularly interested in your comments about the thresholds different people have in order to initiate social change. Um, I was wondering if you've done any research into the factors influencing those thresholds. So just for an example, I, I lead an organization here, getting young adults involved in politics. And our French counterparts find it much easier um, because they say that almost culturally embedded within the constitution is a sense of tackling social inequality. So we're trying to create more zeros. Um, so we're asking, you know, how have you done any research into finding out how we can do that? I, I haven't, but they have done any empirical research, but I'll give you some uh, findings that are in the ballpark. Um, uh, at the White House in, I think, 2016, the social and behavioral sciences team had a meeting in which it announced its results, and Daniel Kahneman spoke. And he said something, I hadn't known this research. He said, what a lot of the behavioral work is finding is connected with an old finding, empirical finding, by Kurt Lewin, an experimental psychologist, which is if you want people to change, it's often tempting to think, what, how do you push them or nudge them or you know, incline them in the preferred direction? And Lewin found that at least across a range of situations, it's better to think, why aren't they doing it anyway and remove the obstacle? And Kahneman's claim was a lot of modern behavioral science is obstacle removal as a instrument for behavioral change. So when I'm thinking about the zeros, if we, if we want people to be zeros, why aren't other people ones and twos? Now, it might be there's some material obstacle to them. It might be there's some cost, which might be economic or social. Um, another thing to think is, is there a norm afoot by which being a zero is uh, rewarded or punished. This is very much related to workplace uh, stuff, where in some workplaces I've been in, to be a you know, recommender, let's say, of change is to be less popular. And in others, to do that is actually a big bonus. And this is all culturally determinable. So to think about, th th some of it's ingrained, my I Irish, friend, he's just a, got a fighting spirit. So if he got in a fist fight, he was probably 55 years old, he didn't mind. And he, was, he liked his chances. That's kind of crazy, but uh, maybe he would have. But he, he didn't mind, he wanted to protect that kid. And that was an, an individual difference. Um, uh, but to think, why aren't people doing it already? To think, what, what is the valence of doing something that it's desired that people do? Is it something where there's self-understanding, their conception of our, their identity, it fits with and promotes? And I'm thinking of things that range from, you know, the civil rights movement of the 60s, which I'm mostly approving of, to Nazism, both of which led to lots of zeros. And how did that happen? I think Hitler had an intuitive sense of Pepsi Max, something like that. Do you, do you think that the, the that zeros, because in the example you gave, that was an instinctive system one reaction. The, I mean, ones and twos are presumably mostly system two, deliberative, thoughtful people. Thanks, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, is the zero? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it wasn't meant as a compliment, but um, <laughs> take it as such, though. Um, but do, does that require more instinctive? reaction to create okay, that's really good to Thank create you. More zeros. So and then is, we'll and then we'll have to conclude unfortunately there is empirical work supporting what you said which is a better answer than I gave to you which suggests that at least number a number of zeros under extremely difficult social circumstances it's just who they are and they say I had no choice so they don't ac account for their own action as reflective and deliberative they say this is just who I was who I am I, and not with pride, with more, you know, just it's like I breathe. I'm, I'm not going to stand there. Brilliant. Thank you. So we're going to, to conclude now. As I say, books out, books inside. 
on the stage to sign drinks outside. Um, thank that's a terrible comparison. Thank <laughs> that, That's in that order, in that order. Um, I haven't finished. I haven't finished, I haven't finished, I haven't finished, I haven't finished. I was going to say thank you, Cass, obviously, brilliant as always. But thank you, questioners, you were succinct, brilliant questions. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you very much for coming, and good night online, wherever I'm pointing. So I should stay here, yeah?